today's the day sort of science, medicine, and the like. And uh, if he shows pictures, close your eyes. Come on, Keith. You've had a good time, haven't you? Great. Good. He didn't know what he was getting into. Paula Silver said I should have him, then he sent me all the stuff, and I knew she was right, and uh, I never would have found you. And a number of the speakers here come over the transom that way, from, you know, uh, Billy Graham, Mark Kwame, told me about Billy Graham and Lee Lu, and those were two amazing talks that we had. So uh, I don't want any PR departments from corporations saying you want to introduce something here. But if you have ideas of people that you know who you think are extraordinary, young, old, next year, or there'll be some ringers. I worked at a great ringer today. Um, just you know, let me know. Send me some stuff on it. I, I'm, you know, I, I don't know if I'll respond to everybody, but you know, I, I, I uh, a number of you. How many people, when you've called me on the called our office on the phone, got me on the phone? See, that's not bad. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Richard. Well. Um, why would a neurosurgeon be invited to a TED conference? And I think it's because of convergence. I'm uh, a neurosurgeon. I operate on about 250 brain tumors a year. My practice is primarily limited to brain tumors, but I'm also a scientist doing translational research to try to find a cure to tumors. So I consider myself a scientist, but I also consider myself an artist because science is the creation of something new and different. And that is what art is. Art is the creation of something new. And someone once, uh, once told me that art is a passion that's practiced with discipline, and science is a discipl discipline that's practiced with passion. And I see the convergence between the two. Really good. Just do those two things again. <laughs> Art is a passion that's practiced with discipline, and science is a discipline that's practiced with passion. The other convergence, and uh, my friend Norm Lear sort of mentioned it, and that is that we don't mention God very much anymore, but I also see a convergence between science and religion. And ultimately, I think that science and religion will become one. You know, if you want to understand an artist, you study his art. If you want to understand God, you study nature. And as a scientist, when we look at nature, what we look at is God. And when I look inside the human brain and I see the incredible complexity of the human brain, what I'm looking at is God's art and it brings me closer to understanding God. And I believe that as a race of people, we created religion to understand our environment. We create science to understand our environment. So it's a convergence between the two. And ultimately, I think that, as I said, science and religion will merge into one, which will be another unifying convergence in the history of, of mankind. The other theme I think that we've heard in this conference is revolutions. We've heard about political revolutions, which is sort of passe, I think. Technological revolutions. But the amazing thing that I'm interested in is the medical revolution that's taken place. And when you look at the revolution that's taken place in medicine, you have to be in awe. I mean, essentially, Western medicine, as we understand it today, started about 5,000 years ago with the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were amazing. I mean. The Egyptian military physicians had sort of made these observations and had localized language to the left side of the brain because soldiers that had injuries to the left side of the brain lost their ability to speak and localized movement to the contralateral side by making these observations. They described how to relocate a dislocated shoulder, which we still use today, described pulse taking, and they recorded all of these observations in the library of Alexandria that the Greek physicians came and studied. At, and they translated this knowledge back to Greece, which sort of started Western medicine. But medicine essentially stayed dormant for 5,000 years. It was dark. Not much happened. And around the 1940s, 
when some of you, I think, were living, uh, that all began to change. We discovered antibiotics, and then in 1953, Jonas Salk developed a vaccine for polio, and a few years after that, we did our first heart transplant, liver transplant, discovered insulin, developed machines that would make the body invisible, like MRI scanners and PET scanners. And the revolution that is now beginning to even transform that, which you hear a lot about, is the Human Genome Project. Uh, within the next year, we would have mapped out all 100,000 genes that define human life. I mean, it may not sound that profound, but when you understand the implications of having a blueprint that basically defines everything that we know about life, and therefore, by definition, everything that we know about disease, it sets up the possibilities to revolutionize the way that we practice medicine, uh, to begin to design sort of intelligent strategies uh, for medicine rather than sort of empiric strategies. And in the 20 minutes that I have, what I thought I would focus on is something that's sort of near and dear to me, is, that is neurosurgery and, and the brain. And neurosurgery is a very young field. Uh, a bunch of general surgeons, big kahunas, decided that they would operate on the brain. And uh, this started uh, in earnest around the 1930s. And these guys, um, I mean, you're talking about big kahunas. When they did an operation on a patient in the early days in neurosurgery, they had about a 70% mortality rate. Now, it wasn't quite this bad. But if you have to understand that if you went into a neurosurgical operation, you had a 30% chance of just surviving that operation 70 years ago. And when, I'm not talking about the morbidity, paralysis, and speech loss. Now, that uh, mortality rate at the institute that we formed in Los Angeles is down to less than 0.1%. And most patients that have complex brain operations can go home in about two or three days. It's an amazing evolution that has taken place. Now, here's the problem. Uh, this is a picture of the, of the human brain doing a neurosurgical operation. And uh, the skull is over here, and the uh, covering of the brain here, which is Latin, it's called dura mater, stands for tough mother, I think. <laughs> I think Sinbad used to be an anatomist in his previous life. <laughs> but uh, here's the brain. It's on the left side in the dominant hemisphere. And somewhere in here is a brain tumor. And somewhere close to this area is eloquent areas that control language, motor movement, sensation. And the challenge for the neurosurgeon is to try to remove this tumor and leave all these eloquent areas intact. And it's not a trivial problem, because this tumor doesn't just stand out and identify itself. It turns out that the tumor is in this area here is a little whiter, uh, but lang uh, language areas are here, and the motor areas are here, and we have this electrode where we're trying to actually map out the motor cortex in relation to the tumor to remove the tumor and leave all these eloquent areas intact. Um, so what we've done is to integrate a lot of technology uh, into this process and using a lot of the technology that many of the people in this room have developed, we've incorporated computers into the operating room. So we've made three-dimensional MRI scans, uh, interface that with the surgical microscopes to basically have a heads-up display like a fighter, fighter pilot would to actually map out where we're going to uh, do our surgeries in, in real time. And so this is sort of a screen that we may look at during the surgery to actually map out where the tumors located in relation to eloquent areas. Um, now, this is, uh, this is what, uh, this was a patient of mine that I had who was a physician that was talking on his telephone uh, in 1991, and he became confused. And his girlfriend rushed over and made him go to the emergency room, and he had this very large tumor that you can see here in the, in the right uh, frontal lobe. And uh, people looked at it and said, well, this is not operable. And that would have given him a death sentence. And so the challenge is, how do you get something like this out and leave all those eloquent areas of language and vision and motor movement intact? 
and using some of the advanced technology uh, that has been developed, we were able to remove this tumor. And essentially, this is the area that was removed. All of the tumor that we could see, that I could see on the MRI scan was removed. And this was a malignant brain tumor. Uh, and if we hadn't removed it, he would have had a prognosis of about nine months, and he's still alive now, 10 years later. And he has no neurologic deficits. He's still practicing as a physician, which is, I think, one of the amazing feats of, of current day neurosurgery. So uh, the technology is, is moving very fast. We say, well, why not just bring the MRI scan right into the operator room? So this is a $3 million scanner. Uh, it's made by one of the uh, companies that is designed to make surgery uh, possible right in the MRI scanner. But I mean, it's not a trivial thing to do. I mean, you got to change all your electronics and magnetic fields. And you can imagine a scalpel blade, you know, flying across the room, uh, stabbing all kinds of things. <laughs> but just to show you how fast the technology is moving, this is a handheld MRI scan that was recently approved by the FDA for veterinarian use. And uh, you can imagine how something like this would basically be incorporated into the surgical table within a few years. So the technology is, is really quite incredible. Um, one of the things that we need to really understand is where the eloquent areas are. The brain is organized in a topographical fashion so that there are areas where we cannot traverse, sacred areas, and then other areas where we can. And we need to be able to know the difference. And it turns out that we're developing technology in our laboratory uh, to basically map out eloquent areas in real time. And this is using reflectance of light. And uh, I'd like to sort of get some of the fiber optic people excited about this. But basically, if you shine light onto the surface of the brain, the reflectance of that light is different whether those areas are activated or not activated. And as we look through the surgical microscope, at an area of brain that contains the uh, area responsible for movement of the fingers, if we put a vibrator on the fingers doing surgery and vibrate those areas, you can see under the microscope that area lighting up in real time. So we're developing technology so that we can map out these areas in, in real time as we, as we um, do our surgery. Uh, the brain is also very unique in that the brain uh, is really the most discriminating uh, organ in the body. And as blood vessels do not allow uh, things to get out of the capillaries into the brain tissue. So even the most elemental of things like sugar and glucose that, we, that the brain uses as its main energy source would not get out of the capillaries into the brain uh, unless it's carried across by a special transport carrier. And this is just for orientation. This is a rat brain. And you can see a tumor in the brain there. And what we've been able to discover in our laboratory is a way to selectively open up these capillaries in the brain for drug delivery, because we know that we're not able to get compounds into the brain to treat diseases like strokes and Alzheimer's disease and brain tumors unless we're able to traverse this blood-brain barrier. And this just shows an orientation. This is a, a rat brain with the tumor in it here. And this is what we call an audioradiogram. And if we inject a radioactive compound into the brain and try to see where it goes, you can see that none of it gets into the brain. Except you see some traces in these large blood vessels here, and almost none of it gets into the tumor, which is the problem of using chemotherapy for brain tumors. It doesn't work because it doesn't get in. But our science has now allowed us to discover a compound that we developed. And you can see another rat with the tumor here where we've injected bradykinin into this area, and now the tumor lights up like a light bulb so that we can increase delivery into those areas. And we're now using that to more effectively treat patients with tumors. The, uh, the Human Genome Project is really incredible. I mean, I think that um, if you look at the way that we currently, uh, in any sort of pathological specimen, and one out of three people in this room would develop cancer in their lifetime, so you ought to pay attention to this. One out of two men, you'll get cancer. One out of three women. And the pathologist will look at that tissue, and he'll say, well, you know, um, yeah, I think this is a little bit more cellular, or this is uh, a little bit different. And we'll call this a grade four tumor. It's really very crude. With the map of all 100,000 genes, we can move away from this very crude description 
to actually begin to classify tumors by the genes that they express and really abandoning you know, the sort of descriptive grading system. If I ask everybody in this audience to describe this picture, you come up with different descriptions, which is what happens with pathology. But we now have genetic microchips, essentially, gene membranes. And this is one of these chips here that we use. And each one of these dots represents a different gene in tissue. Uh, so we can take a, a normal tissue and we can take a tumor and basically characterize up to 40,000 different genes very rapidly that have been expressed in the tumor versus the normal tissue. And so we can get a genetic profile of the tumor that's very precise. It's like a genetic fingerprint rather than a description uh, by the pathologist. And so we can predict how a tumor would behave on a genetic basis. We know that some tumors don't respond to chemotherapy so that we can give chemotherapy only to patients that the tumor will respond to, avoiding toxic treatments to a whole group of patients, which I think will sort of redefine the way that we practice medicine. I think one of the areas that uh, is, is, is very rewarding in the treatment of cancer is really understanding how to use the body's own defenses to fight cancer. And <clears throat> we're developing cancer all the time. We get cells that become aberrant form of cancer, but our immune system is able to recognize those cells, eradicate them, and we never uh, recognize the clinical manifestation of cancer. So in order for cancer to survive, the first thing that the cancer has to do is to learn how to evade the immune system. And the way that brain tumors do this is that they learn to become invisible to the immune system. They become stealth. And the, they're able to grow without the immune system ever being able to recognize the tumor. The other thing that they do is that they begin to release proteins into the environment that make the immune system defective uh, and um, begin to express certain receptors on the blood vessels that induce the immune cells to undergo what we call programmed cell death. So one of the revolutions that we uh, have witnessed occur is the understanding of how our body is not able to fight a cancer because of its ability to avoid the immune system. Now, this gives us an incredible opportunity now to revolutionize the way that we treat cancer. Because the way that we normally treat cancer is with surgery, try to slash it out, chemotherapy, try to poison the body, or radiation, and try to burn it. I mean, it's primitive. It's barbaric. It's crude. But understanding how the immune system uh, is able to detect it, we've been able to develop a vaccine for cancer. And so we went into the laboratory, understanding that the first thing we had to do was to get the cancer to recognize the immune system, and basically developed a vaccine for a brain tumor. And this is a rat model with the brain tumor. And you can see that all of the rats without the brain tumor all died after about 25 or 30 days. But the rats that we injected with the vaccine uh, to basically get the system to recognize the tumor uh, were able to eradicate the tumor, and more than half of these rats went on to survive. And so what we did is that we took that into a, what we call a phase one clinical trial in patients. And for the last two years, we've treated 20 patients with this vaccine that had the most aggressive form of malignant brain tumors called a glioblastoma, where essentially they had a life expectancy of about six to nine months. And of the 20 patients that we've treated uh, over the past two years, 17 are still alive and doing well. The way that it works is that we essentially take the tumor out at the time of surgery. We grow the tumor in test tube, like you heard about with X-Files. Um, and then we're able to, to strip the, uh, the proteins, the center of the tumor, uh, from the tumor cells, and we isolate a very specialized blood cell from the body called a dendritic cell, which is the most potent way of presenting these antigens to the immune system. And we mix these with special chemicals and cytokines. These dendritic cells take up the scent. We give this back as a shot. It presents the antigen to the immune system. The T cells seize this antigen. They divide into millions of activated T cells and go throughout the body searching to destroy the, uh, the uh, tumor cells. 
And this is the first patient that we treated. You can see it's very simple. You just get a little shot under the skin, like a real vaccine. She had had a surgery. They wear their little headband where we save all the hair. We don't shave the hair now. And you can see a bottle of water, very healthy. And uh, we've demonstrated now that uh, we have a new frontier. We can actually, actually begin to develop intelligent strategies to, uh, to treat a devastating form of disease. Well, I'm a Star Trek fan, and I don't know how many of you guys are, are, are Star Trek fans, but I like Star Trek. And in one of, the, one of the movies, the Enterprise had to come back to the 20th century to get a will to take back into the future. And Bones went into an operating room, and he turned to Captain Kirk, and he said, my God, Jim, they're actually cutting the patient open. And uh, I mean, when you think about it, even though I'm a neurosurgeon and I do 250 operations a year, Surgery is pretty barbaric. And so what we wanted to do was to develop a methodology to basically eliminate the need to do surgery. And so we've developed this sort of microwave waveguide where we can put microwave energy directly into the tumor, heat the cells up to 70 degrees centigrade, the tumor cells, by vibrating the tissue, which selectively destroys the tumor cells and leaves the normal cells intact. And uh, we've been doing that. You can do it in an open MRI scanner. It's non-invasive. The brain has no sensation, so patients don't feel it. It provides sensation to the rest of the body, but it itself doesn't feel anything. And you can destroy a tumor right in the operating room uh, and have the patient go home that same day without the need for open surgery. And this was one of the patients that we treated. This was a, uh, a patient I had operated on previously who had really a, a multiple personality syndrome. And that is fascinating in and of itself. But she had this malignant brain tumor in, in the left frontal area, very close to her language areas. And we did a surgery awake, initial surgery. And we found that part of the tumor extended into the language area, so we couldn't resect it all. And so we treated her with radiation and chemotherapy a few years back. And she did fine for her a number of years, but then the tumor recurred. Here's the cavity that we had removed. You can see the tumor recurred along both edges of the cavity, one here and one here. And we could not treat this one because this was in the language area, but uh, we just did her in the MRI scanner and basically ablated the tumor with the microwave energy here. And this was at day one. And you can see that 32 weeks later, both areas had sort of regressed. And maybe we shouldn't be cutting these tumors out because if you leave all of this necrotic debris, the immune system can, can come and mop it up and then become activated and actually seek out and destroy other tumor cells. And I, I think that the day will come when probably very soon, I mean, people say, oh, I want to be a brain surgeon. I say, well, you have to realize that it's not going to be the, the macho stuff that we're doing now, opening and cutting. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be using a computer. So it's changing very fast. And uh, I was riding on the uh, airplane, and I saw this ad for one of the spine centers. And it said, one of these women had back surgery yesterday. And you can see the little Band-Aid on her back. This isn't Bernie Man. This is, but, uh, <laughs> but it's actually showing her little Band-Aid right here. So our response to that is that one of these people had brain surgery five minutes ago. And so here's the future of neurosurgery. <laughs> so um, the goal that we have is to, uh, is to uh, get, I think, the, the young generation, the, uh, the people that are going to really make this revolution happen, excited about science. And we have a program called BrainWorks where we bring sixth and seventh grade students in to learn about the fascination of the brain. But it's like that old Chinese proverb, may you live in an interesting time. Bless you. <laughs>